the Bohr model has provided us with everything we need to describe the hydrogen emission spectrum. This video is about the hydrogen emission spectrum, and it's part of a playlist on quantum mechanics. You can find the link to this playlist in the description below. I'll be referring to some of the previous videos where I actually derived some important expressions. So this guy over here in the blue box, this is the Rydberg formula. We're going to be using this very shortly. First of all, I want to try and explain this diagram over here. This is a visualization of all the allowed energies for an electron in the Bohr model. So as we've talked about in the previous videos, the electron behaves as if it was a planet orbiting the sun. In this case, the sun is the nucleus with some positive charges in there. We're going to focus on hydrogen where there's just one positive charge. So let's have a look at what this diagram is trying to tell us. This diagram can be divided into two important regions. So there's everything below this dotted line and everything above this dotted line. Above the dotted line, the electron is in an unbound state. And below the dotted line, it is in a bound state. So it is bound to the nucleus when it is in this region, and it is unbound. It is a free particle when it is in this region over here. There are two important properties that we can actually uh, assign to these regions. Up here, the electron has a continuous energy spectrum. So it can have any possible energy because it's unbound. It's not influenced by the nucleus, so there's no conditions that limit its energy to a discrete set. But when the electron is bound to the nucleus, it can only have a discrete set of energies. It can't have any energy that is in between these black lines. So all of these energies in this white space between the black lines, they are forbidden. The electron cannot have those energies. Why? This is all a consequence of quantization. So angular momentum quantization is actually what we can use to derive the expressions for energy. So the nth energy level is going to be related to the ground state energy. So that's this lowest energy level. The ground state energy divided by n squared is actually going to give us the nth energy level. And we derived that in a previous video. So this guy over here, E2, is actually a quarter in magnitude of E1. But why is it bigger? It's because all of these guys are negative. So there's a 1 over n squared relationship between uh, all of these guys and the, the basic energy. So the E1, the ground state energy. We, just, we divide by n squared, and that's going to give us all of these other guys. And they're actually going to get closer and closer and closer until in the limit, as n goes to infinity, they reach 0. And 0 over here, that's actually the point where the electron is going to get ionized. So ionization is the process where the electron uh, moves from a bound state to an unbound state. So it leaves the influence of the nucleus. The nucleus no longer has a hold of the electron. So that is actually the process of ionization. And if you're trying to ionize hydrogen, uh, you start off with a neutral hydrogen atom. That's one proton in the nucleus and one electron orbiting around. And then you give that electron enough energy to escape. And what does that do? That just leaves one proton by itself. That's a H plus ion. So the proton is by itself, and the electron has turned into a free particle, and it has some energy up here. It's a positive energy. So there is also another way you can define the energy. You can set the zero to be the ground state. You could set zero to be down here, and then all energies are going to be positive. They're going to be above the ground state energy. But with that convention, uh, you don't get this neat uh, distinction between positive and negative. Because here, the sign of the energy tells us whether the electron is trapped in the atom or whether it's a free particle. So the most important distinction between unbound and bound states is that these states, these positive energy states, have a continuous spectrum. So any energy is allowed. But these guys down here, there's only a discrete spectrum. So only a fixed, uh, a discrete set of energies are allowed. And this is actually the interesting part. This is what we're going to be talking about. Because this area over here is what's going to help us explain the hydrogen emission spectrum. So let's talk about two processes, emission and absorption. Emission happens when an electron in a higher state drops down to a lower state. And in that process, it releases a photon. And that photon has the same energy as the difference between those two states. So that is emission. Absorption 
is kind of like the mirror image of emission. Absorption is when the electron starts in a lower state, it gets hit by a photon, absorbs the energy, and jumps up to a higher state. But you've got to remember, the photon has to have exactly the right energy so that it can make this energy difference happen. Right? So the photon can't have any energy. It can't have an energy that's half this distance. It has to have an energy that is a, a complete chunk. So this entire chunk, and that has to be packaged in the photon, so the photon can uh, be absorbed by the electron, and the electron can jump to a higher energy state. This is all a consequence of quantization. So energy is quantized, and that's why we're not allowed to have any of these uh, white space energies here. It's only the black lines that are allowed. So if we look at every possible emission from an electron dropping from a higher state to a lower state, we can actually group them together. And we can group them together based on what energy level they're dropping down to. So if you look at this series over here, Lyman series, this guy uh, is, these guys are all grouped together based on the fact that the electrons all drop down to the ground state. And the ground state actually corresponds to n equals 1. So n is, uh, n actually denotes the energy level that the electrons are dropping down to. And m denotes the energy that they were coming from. So m is the initial state, and n is the final state. And that actual difference in the energy, that is what energy is given to the photon that gets emitted. And that's the thing that we measure. We measure the emitted photon. We can find its wavelength, and from the wavelength, we know the frequency, and we know the energy. So from the wavelength of photons, we can infer the energy difference. And that actually allows us to verify Bohr's model. And Bohr's model does predict everything accurately to a decent approximation. So uh, an important condition that we have to uh, always remember when we're applying the Rydberg formula is that m is bigger than n. You might also see this written as n1 and n2, but keep in mind this n is smaller than this m. So because these guys are positive integers, m has to be at least one bigger. right? So in the Lyman series, if n is equal to 1, which is the case for all the guys in Lyman series, the smallest value that m could possibly have is 2. right? Because you can't start at the ground state and then finish at the ground state and expect a photon to come out. Because if you're staying at the same energy, you're not emitting any photons. Photons only get emitted if there's a drop in energy. So if you start at a higher state and go down to a lower state. So that is the first guy in the Lyman series. The next guy is m equals to 3 dropping down to n equals 1. And then we've got 4, 5, 6, 7, all the way up to infinity. And the Lyman series is actually going to converge to an energy value of those photons that is the same as the ground state energy. So if you look at the, the emission spectrum, the Lyman series converges to E1. And E1 is the ground state energy. Now let's have a look at the Balmer series. The Balmer series has n equal to 2. So all the guys are dropping down to the first excited state. So n equals 2 is the first excited state. This guy's the ground state. This guy's the first excited state. And we've got the second excited state. So that, that, that can actually be continued on. The third excited, fourth, fourth excited, and so on. So the Balmer series, all of these guys are dropping down to n equals 2. And m has the lowest value of 3. M can't be 2 now, because if, if it starts at 2 and finishes at 2, it's not going to emit a photon. That's just going to be an electron staying at the same energy level. It's the same reasoning for the Lyman series. And we can continue this reasoning on, and we get to the passion series. And the passion series is uh, actually associated with n equals 3. So n equals 3, that is what uh, energy level all of these electrons are dropping down to. So in principle, these guys are actually going to contain an infinite number of possible energies. But in practice, we're not actually going to be able to distinguish uh, a lot of the big ones from each other. right? Because if you go to m equals 100 and m equals 101, they're very, very close. right? That's because uh, this actually converges to a specific energy. And the energy is associated with a wavelength. And that wavelength is, the, is actually the thing that we measure. So each of these little series are uh, always going to converge to a particular wavelength. And that wavelength is associated with the energy difference that is from the lowest level in the series to E equals 0. 
So the passion series is actually going to converge to E3, and E3 is going to give us a wavelength as well. So how do you get the wavelength? Well, you get the wavelength by plugging in the integer values. And these integer values you can get from the diagram. So it is a bit of a hassle to go uh, the other way. It's a bit of a hassle to start with the wavelengths and try and work out the integers. But it's actually very easy to start with the integers and then get a wavelength out of that. So this was experimentally determined, and then the Bohr model came, came, uh, came into fruition, and it actually allowed us to derive this expression from first principles. So that's the beauty of the Bohr model. One thing I want to uh, uh, say before we finish this video is that these guys over here are not in the visible spectrum. And neither are these guys. These guys are in infrared, and these guys are in ultraviolet. The Balmer series is actually the only one you can see with the naked eye. With these other guys, you have to use uh, equipment to actually measure it. So the Balmer series is, uh, a lot of these members in the Balmer series are between 400 and 700 nanometers. And that's what our eyes can actually pick up. That's the visible spectrum of light. And if we kept going on further beyond the Passion series, we'd get to the Bracket series, and then the Funt series, and then there's a there's an infinite number of possible series that you can have. But they're going to have really, really, really tiny energies, and they're going to be very difficult to distinguish. They're going to be in the far infrared region. Right? This is a distant, distant infrared region that you cannot see with the naked eye. So if you look at the emission spectrum of hydrogen, you're probably seeing the Balmer series. And this is something that we can experimentally verify. So in this video, I'll give a quick summary. What we talked about was the practical, real-world, experimental evidence for Bohr's model. So Bohr's model does actually explain the hydrogen emission spectrum. That's what uh, the, the early physicists working in quantum mechanics, that's what they set out to do. They wanted to explain these natural phenomena, but they had to invent new physical laws. Right? Quantum mechanics had to be developed as an addition to classical mechanics because classical mechanics was not uh, sufficient to explain all of this magic over here. So the important takeaway message is you need to know how to read these energy level diagrams. What you can do is you can construct any possible emission. And always keep in mind that the absorption process is just the reverse of emission. So if a photon gets emitted from a drop, so for example, this guy, the first guy in the Lyman series, if a photon uh, gets emitted when an electron drops from the first excited state to the ground state, the absorption process is just going to be the reverse. It's just going to be a photon hitting the ground state electron and exciting it up to the first excited state. So emission and absorption are like mirror images of each other. So that is an important takeaway message. And also remember that quantization only happens because of these little boundary conditions that we get. So quantization is not actually the most important fundamental thing in quantum mechanics, even though quantum mechanics is called quantum mechanics. But quantum mechanics uh, predicts quantization as a kind of little caveat or a special little thing that emerges in the details of the mathematical understanding. So I hope this video was helpful. Now you know how to apply the Bohr model to the hydrogen emission spectrum by using the Rydberg formula. You can watch the other videos in this playlist by clicking here.